टू वन होम रेशन दिस थिंग एस यू टू टू एस ओ थ्री सो वी हैव नो एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ बोथ आई सब ऑफिसम्स इन होम ऑफिसम्स now i want to go into basic definitions of things like subgroups so my plan is first to go into general ideas okay hopefully with lots of examples if you want more examples just ask and eventually settle down to Uh, discussing in the finite case particularly the permutation group in a fairly uh, complete way so i will do the representation theory of the permutation group to the extent that time permits okay? and then we will go into continuous group okay? continuous means what they call lie <coughs> lie groups so that way i will have a hopefully a balanced presentation of both Uh, finite groups and lie groups so what is a subgroup well, the definition is e quite obvious okay a subgroup h of a group g is a subset which is closed which is itself a group okay under the group class g so so, so H1, H2 is in H. Implies the product is in H. Okay. H1, HI inverse is in H, and then identity is in H. Okay. You are not allowed to introduce new multiplication rules in H. Okay. You can sometimes do it, but that will not be called a subgroup. So under the same multiplication laws you are encountering in G, H is closed. H is a closed set. <coughs> so let us look at the examples. Okay. Let me look, for example, on the group S three. Okay. S three is permutations on three objects, okay. and This is three. Okay. Yes, two subgroups. Okay. Namely, uh, permuting. Okay. Consisting of identity and the permutation of I and G. Okay. And. Uh, So just transposing two of the elements. Okay. So there are three such subgroups, all of which are S two. Okay. So it, it, because they are permutations, isomorphic to S two, and they are clearly isomorphic. Let me look at a slightly more complicated example. Let me look at SO three rotations in three dimensions. This has an infinite number of SO two subgroups. What can that be? 
Can you get? Okay. What may be this a group? Can you tell? Round an axis, huh? fixed axis. Yeah. So, one particular again, okay. uh, one such will be rotations around an axis n. You take all rotations around that axis. That is a sub, and it is uh, simply like a rotation in a plane, okay. namely the plane perpendicular to this axis. And also clearly, they are all isomorphic, okay. all isomorphic. The map, okay, the isomorphic, the isomorphism is isomorphism since. Rotation by theta around n okay, to the rotation by the same angle theta around m okay, to rotation by same angle. Theta around M. There is clearly clearly an isomorphism map. But this group has some other subgroups which are of great interest. SO3 has several discrete subgroups, okay. has I may not remember all of them, the uh, tetrahedral, icosahedral, oak, or the what is it called, uh, symmetries of what they call platonic figures. No? So, it has example will be the, uh, the tetrahedral group, what does it consist of? So, this consists of four elements 1, 1, 1, 1, determinant must be minus 1. 1, no, determinant must be plus 1. So, it will be minus 1, 1, minus 1. Then you have what? One more, minus 1, minus 1. There is one more possibility. Minus 1, minus 1, 1. Okay. This one thing, okay. four element group. This is the symmetry. If you, some of you know, this is the symmetry of the molecule C2H4. If you know this molecule, carbon, carbon, I think, ethylene, I think. So, these are rotations by pi, this is nothing, this is rotations by pi around three perpendicular axes, okay. this one, this one, and this one. And the ethylene molecule, for example, if I rotate this around this axis by pi, you get back the same uh, figure. If I rotate around this by pi, you get the same figure. And if you rotate by pi around this axis, you get the same figure. So, this is the symmetry of this ethylene molecule, but there are other more much more complicated things. What is it called? I am not remembering all the names. This icosahedral, dodecahedral, There is some more things. There is also some funny group consisting of uh, a rotation around one axis and a reflection. There is a rotation. Okay. It also has another another subgroup. Okay. This is not. I don't know what it is called. It consists of all rotations. Around third axis, let us say. So it will be cos theta, sin theta, 
minus sin theta cos theta 0. So, it is rotating around third axis not 0 1 then so I am rotating around the third axis then I rotate by pi around the perpendicular axis. So, I take this rotation by pi. So, it will be minus 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 minus 1. So, I rotate around this and I rotate by pi around this axis. This also comes for some molecule. I am trying to remember what uh, oh yeah. if you take a, a molecule like this with some identical things here say n n I do not know what what this n is. This one if I rotate around this axis does not change if I rotate take here I rotate by pi like this nothing happens. So, for that the symmetry group so called symmetry group is this. So, there are other things never mind, now, but I want to look as an example what happens with SU 2. And I want to just check this all these things have counterparts in SU2, but here most interesting thing maybe we have time to look at later that this the T4 the dihedral group T4 Hamilton becomes something very interesting so called binary dihedral group. which is a non abelian group that is it is not commutative I mean elements of the group do not commute it is called d star 8 and I will give you the elements consists of 1 plus minus 1 and plus minus i tau i i is 1 2 3. This is a Pauli matrices you can check that these are in SU 2 and there are 8 elements here ok. So, this one if I take this group and quotient this by that is uh, you take the isomorphism map homomorphism map from SU2 to SO3 which I gave you and see what happens here it becomes that T4 group okay. and it turns out that this has some role to play in chemistry. For example, the degeneracy of the spectrum of the ethylene molecule in its ground state it, it, this group governs it. Okay. Now, let me give other examples. Yeah. Mm. Four. Clearly, real orthogonal matrices are unitary. That's obvious, right? So immediately we find an inclu uh, an inclusion like O n is contained in U n. But in fact, we uh, then some obvious things will be things like u2 is contained in u3 is contained in you can easily read off these things. Okay. For example, in the 3 by 3 matrices of u3, this u2 will be the 2 by 2 block, it is not unique, you can take any 2 by 2 block or any similarity, similarity transformation of that. Okay. But there is something more uh, non familiar, for example namely this is also true that if you take un this is a subgroup of so 2 n this is somewhat interesting this is actually quite interesting not uh, let me show it to you okay. this is quite interesting and it comes in the in discussions of quantization if you uh, look at uh, if some of you are familiar with symplectic forms and so on this thing comes uh, complex structures this thing comes ok. So, what is this? Well, u n leaves the following quadratic form invariant z i prime bar z i invariant ok it is from i equal to 1 to n. because it is a unitary group 
No, if I write Z i as real and imaginary part, what happens? This becomes simply x i square plus y i square. Is a, it is just a real type scalar product in two n dimension. Now, do the following. Okay. If u, which is an element of my u n, acting on z, okay. So u is n by n. So u is uh, u is n by n, some matrix. Z is acting on z n. Is equal to say z one prime. Up, up to Zn prime. Separate real and imaginary parts. That is, right. Zi as xi plus i by i on this side. On this side, Z1 prime. You write this xi prime plus i y i prime. Then the way, but that remark this implies that summation x i square plus y i square is equal to summation x i prime square plus y i prime square. By that remark there, and furthermore, okay, and the transformation It's a 2n by 2n matrix for u, so I am going to get some 2n by 2n matrix, okay, which sends this uh, x1 up to xn, y1 up to yn, okay, to this one x1 prime to xn prime, y1 prime up to yn prime, okay, is linear. Leaves a quadratic form invariant. It's a linear transformation. And clearly, R is real. Because it is mapping a real vector to a real vector. So, we conclude that this matrix R u is living in SO2 n. I will. I'm going to do that right now. Okay. So her remark, this, which is, uh, uh, this is quite explicit. That's also explicit, but more um, elegant, I would say. Okay. The idea is the following. Okay. You will see immediately, immediately that this uh, the matrix, uh, the, the point is the following. Okay. Roll of, let me write, chain remark. Let me call it epsilon. This is our notation. You would have come across this object if you had done classical mechanics. Okay. It is anti symmetric matrix. Okay. So, epsilon is anti symmetric. Epsilon is real and epsilon squared is minus 1. Okay. Now, look at I. Okay. This and so, fact, uh, what I want to say is this I here, the co imagine the unit I has a property that it is changing in sign. Okay. The uh, reality is then I squared is minus one. Okay. 
the self-adjoinedness of reals, if I consider real objects, dagger becomes transpose, okay? so corresponds to anti-symmetry. And this is the of epsilon. And this corresponds to the fact that epsilon squared is minus one. So this epsilon has all the properties of I. So following up G, what we do, for example, when people discuss how to quantize uh, systems with the finite number of degrees of freedom, is we take this u in u n okay, and we write this as u plus u star over 2. So, this is a u real plus i times u minus u star over 2 i. This is the imaginary part of u. Of course, it is real. I mean, I have put out the i there, and you replace this by one two cross two tensor u r. So this is now two n by two n matrix plus get rid of this epsilon one i by replacing by epsilon tensor u i. You, I, you agree with me, right? And this thing here is real, and you can check that it is in SO2. Okay. This is the same as what we did by separating real and imaginary parts, but it looks nicer. It is nicer. And it brings in the role of this anti symmetry matrix, okay, which is what comes in canonical quantization. If you Take the Poisson bracket of positions and momenta, you get this minus sign. Okay, minus QP Poisson bracket is minus uh, is one. That anti-symmetric matrix PQ is minus one. It is that thing that is coming here. Now I want to look at a another example. Poincaré group. P. I remind you what it is. Okay. Consists of a translation and a Lorentz transformation with the product which is a prime plus lambda prime a lambda prime lambda. Okay. This is what I had done earlier, but one thing I forgot to say here last time was it has what is the uh, I did not write the inverse of A lambda, which is good to know. Okay. What is the inverse of A lambda for this group? It is minus lambda inverse A lambda inverse. You can check it. Okay. But take this multiplied by A lambda, you get identity. The identity is simply 0, 1. And in this group, there are two distinguished subgroups. So, translations let me call it T4, which consists of all translations of this kind, and Lorentz transformations. We call it L. It should be all this thing with no no zero translation and elements of lambda form subgroups. When we say Lorentz transformations, we always mean Lorentz transformations up to an isomorphism. We don't distinguish between groups which are isomorphic. Okay. Notice that this is not canonical. There are a lot of translation subgroups. Not only this, 
Can you tell me another one? Completely isomorphic to this T4. Which won't look like this at all if you work it out. But within the Lorentz group, within the Poincare group. Can you guess? We sort of uh, discussed it last time. Okay. I can take that one and conjugate it with the Lorentz transformation. Okay. So, note if I take T4 and I conjugate it 0 lambda, 0 lambda inverse, since these things do not pass through T4, this will be isomorphic to T4. To translations, right? Yeah. Or likewise, you can. Uh, in fact, we can work it out. Be well. This is easy. But I can do the other way also. If I take Lorentz transformations and I take any translation, a one, a one inverse is isomorphic to L. Right? Because this is the inner conjugation. Last time we proved the they argued that inner conjugation is an isomorphism, right? So this is an isomorphism. In this case, it is rather easy what it is. So in this case, A one, if I put these things, will become lambda A one. So, it simply becomes a Lorentz transform translation. Okay. Here you will get a mess. If you do this, okay. you already for rotations, you take rotation and they translate it rotations, okay. you will get some funny thing. Okay. But here you have both uh, not only rotations, but also Lorentz transformation and they translate the Lorentz transformation. What happens? It look very funny. In fact, it is very funny and causes difficulties in identifying what you mean by rotations in a moving frame, things of that kind. Okay. So, anyway, this has to be kept in mind. Okay. So, that brings me to this issue of cosets and invariance of those. or normal subgroups. Let us look at first cosets left these are way of these are ways of partition in the group into disjoint sets. Okay. So, if H is a subgroup, of G, okay, a, a left coset is G H, G is in G. So, this is a left coset. A right coset is at G. What is its importance? Well, first later when we look at groups acting on manifolds, for example, rotations acting on manifolds, or three dimensional vector space rotation is acting. The action of your symmetry group on manifolds is completely class can be classified understood in terms of courses. Okay. We will see that later especially when we start doing continuous groups. The second is that if when H has a certain property, this lets us give a, gives us the notion of dividing a group by a subgroup. Okay. What corresponds to division of a group by a subgroup to get another group? Okay. 
So, we are also going in that direction when we are discussing this subject. Okay. So, what are the pro important properties here? Okay. If you want uh, theorem, I kept saying that I have not understood the difference between theorem and lemma and uh, what one more thing is there. Uh, Corollary theorem, lemma, there is one more thing. Axiom, you know. Axiom is the assumption, you just dogma. Catholic dogma is replaced by axiom in mathematics, nothing more. <laughs> so, there is one more thing, <laughs> I forgot. Anyway, anyway this theorem is the statement is the following. Okay. Let us consider it for left courses. First statement is two left courses are either totally disjoint <coughs> or identical. So, what this means is G H is intersection G prime H for any G and G prime is either equal to G H okay, or G prime H okay, is a symmetric anyway okay, or is null. Secondly, if an element g bar is in g h, then g bar h is equal to g h. Okay. I should have said at the beginning okay, here. Note, I should have said that G is union of G G H, which is union of G H G. Call it, I will tell you why. Namely, the union of all the courses gives you all the elements of the group. That I should have said. Okay. But this is, I am writing union, I do not know whether they are disjoint or not. But now, I, in fact, those unions are disjoint unions and why is this case okay. why is alpha true alpha is true for rather trivial reason because why why is alpha true when I take the union I get back all members of the set okay. All H is identity, no? So G H is G. So you are finished, right? Right? Because identity is in H. Okay, so you. Take any element G bar from G H. G H is a set, no? Take anything and form a new coset. You will not get anything, you will get back the old one. As I said, okay. G bar, I am multiplying all elements of the group H, subgroup H. So, this one will consist of, G H will consist of. Okay. So, let us look at, so, if you want to proof, okay. first we notice, okay, let me write A, okay, that uh, G1, G2 belong to the same coset, 
if and only if G1 inverse G2 belongs to H. Proof is rather easy. Why? For okay. if G1, G2 belongs to GH, then there exists H1, H2 such that G1 is GH1, G2 is GH2. Yes? A definition. So we see that uh, the way I have written it. Okay, G one inverse. Yeah, this implies G one inverse G two. The G's cancel is H one inverse H two, which belongs to H. Only if I should say okay, if this is only if this also if G one inverse G two belongs to H, okay, we know that G one inverse G two is some H in H. What do I want to say? I want to say that if G1, they belong to the same coset. Okay. So G2 is G1H. So you see immediately that G2 belongs to G2H, okay, which is equal to G1HH, which is G1H, which contains G1. Yes. So two G's belong to the same left coset if and only if this condition is fulfilled. Yeah. Now B. Okay. I want to prove that they are either totally disjoint or identical. So if G one H intersection G to H okay, is not null, there are some common element. Okay. This has a common element with this one. There exists H i such that G 1 H 1 is equal to G 2 H 2. There is some common element, there is some intersection, common element. So, there is some H1 here and some H2 here. So, this equation is fulfilled. So, this is from here, okay. This uh, I want to show that these two so imp implies G1H, which is G1H1H, because H1H is which is G2 H2H, which is G2H. Yes, so they are identical. Yes. There is no intersection, nothing to prove. There is one, there is an intersection, there is one element in common. Then for that element, there is some H1 here and H2 here, I have this equation. So let me look at the cosets. I look at G1H, but small h are multiplying this, there is nothing. So I write like this. But this is equal to this, so I write like this. Then I absorb back, I get this. So that is equal to this. So the cosets are identical. <laughs> so what I have got here is a partitioning of the group into disjoint sets, right. So, 
we have a partitioning of the group G into disjoint courses, left courses GH. Similarly for right courses. There is no proof, difference in the proof. This automatically tells you some very funny result, not obvious. I think it is due to Lagrange. Okay. okay, before I do that, okay, I also want to put this part here. Okay. Finally, I want to prove this part here. How will I prove it? If G bar is in GH, I want to prove that G bar H is GH. Why? G bar H. G bar H is either disjoint from GH or is identical. But it is not disjoint because this contains intersection of this, this contains G bar. Okay. This intersection contains okay, right. This is set this contains G bar because H has identity. This contains G bar by hypothesis. So these two courses are not disjoint. So, they have no chance, they are equal. This means that you can label the courses by picking one element. So, we can label the courses left or right. Okay. by picking one element each. Well, it may or may not be possible, I mean there may be, okay, I change, uh, what is it? This is a side remark, okay. but I'll, for finite case, no problem. Suppose you take G to be SU, say SO3, and I'll take my H to be rotation on rotations around third axis. So I have a cos so I have uh, this partitioning. So I have rotations around the like, uh, x-axis, third axis. Then I multiply it by some roti another rotation, get something else, and so on. Now I try picking one element from each set. Okay. Claim from. Uh, this set R H, okay. this set okay. R is in SO3, it is impossible to pick one R from each of these things in a smooth way, impossible to pick This is a side remark. 
some physical reason for me to say this. Okay. I'll come. One for each. Okay. From each coset. So it is equivalent to picking a unique rotation from third axis to any other direction. I'll come. Harder. It's my fault, but I uh, see. I'm today. I heard the, the newspaper that you get weak if you are a vegetarian. Mr. Modi has declared that in Gujarat people are thin because they are vegetarians. So I am a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> so it creates problems. Okay. But you can ask me. I'll try my best. I am aware of my fault. It's not that I am not aware. So, this is why did I say this? It is equivalent to saying that in third, to try take the two dimensions here, so this is S2, and you try to find one rotation which takes you from here to here. Okay, you try to pick from here some particular rotation, some Euler angles, so you take from here to here. You try doing it all over this here. Can you do it? Impossible. Okay. There are many ways of showing this, okay. and this result is what leads you to magnetic monopoles. By some strange uh, imagination of Paul Dirac, this ends up by predicting that electric charge is quantized by something he wrote at the age of I think must have been 22 or 23. You have plenty of time. I mean he wrote <laughs> <laughs> it was in 1931 that he wrote the paper. Okay. This is this is called this obstruction. This is the same statement that the polar and azimuthal coordinates theta phi cannot be parameterizing the two dimensional sphere in a one to one way impossible because if it were this is the same statement all these statements are the same okay. because if theta phi the polar and azimuth were giving a point of the sphere uniquely the sphere will look like a square what No, no. This is the uh, this is the core of his argument. He doesn't say like this, but it is this is a core of his argument, which then ends up by saying that electromagnetic bonopoles can exist in quantum theory in the 1931 paper, and nowadays we call it by various names like Hopf vibration and stuff. Okay, but he did it in 1931. Yes. Sorry? Kumbh in this year, yes, the same. Hmm. This is the same. If it were possible, you can see contradiction. The sphere looked like a square. Huh? If you can produce theta and phi from 0 to pi and 0 to 2 pi, and uniquely way, the sphere should look like a square, but that is nonsense, right? because the uh, sphere is not a square. Okay? So something is wrong. And the reason is that the map, the coordination is singular, many to one, at some point, necessarily. Sorry. Anyway, that is a side remark. But uh, so there, there are this statement about cosets, pick, labeling cosets by sing elements, does not always work. And the most interesting cases are where it fails. Okay. So this happens quite routinely when you go in. Actually, it happens already in chemistry, many cases. Okay. But the chemists don't seem interested in this. In quantum field theory, it happens with great frequency. But uh, we'll come back to this. Okay. A consequence.
for finite groups just as a aside I think it is called uh, Lagrange let G denote order G this result is not at all obvious if you just look at this no? I am going to say what Lagrange says then the order of the subgroup H divides the order G to give the number of courses of left or right you see the proof is counting proof you just write yes. this is simply counting proof for I can write G as disjoint union of G i H then count each of these things have an order I am just multiplying H by so order is H because I am just taking H and multiplying each by G the order here is G it is disjoint union so G better divide H and give you the number of courses okay. so theorem of Lagrange Lag uh, yeah I think Lagrange very simple but not obvious if you try to guess it um, without any uh, understanding it is one of these trick proofs okay. proof for all finite groups another thing I will stay here I will stay here but you can think about it a group order a group of prime order is cyclic what does it mean that is okay these are the form identity z from z to the k then z to the k plus 1 is z a group of prime order is cyclic not obvious right the reason is that you cannot have a subgroup okay I will come to that okay. the, is prime order so prime is there nothing which can divide it okay. so you have to play around with this a little bit and then you get the answer okay, okay. now I want to look at a slight refinement of this concept so we have discussed courses okay. now I give you a definition H is an invariant subgroup of G uh, or normal if G H G inverse is H that is in this case okay. left and right cosets are the same
that is GH is HG. And we can write G over H as G H is a definition for H G. They are they are all the same. The space of cosets. You do not have to distinguish left and right, so you can simply write like this. We will give many examples, but today I will want to finish by saying before I elaborate on it next week theorem G over H is a group under set multiplication okay. in this multiplication h is identity and the inverse of g h is simply g inverse of h So, G over H is the, the fact uh, is a group, the factor group of G by H So, and this the proof is two lines but we need to look at examples for A it is clear that G 1 H G 2 H here I am multiplying this set here by this set here. So, I just multiply it say element by element, but G 2 can pass through here. So, it is G 1 G 2 H H, but H H is H as I said. So, it is simply G 1 G 2 H. Hmm? So, this is a multiplication law and H is identity because G H H is simply G H and finally, the inverse G H G inverse H is H right? because I can pass this through and multiply here. So, get identity. So, implying G inverse H in the Poincare group, it will be practically impossible to say what is a Lorentz transformation. Okay? All thing will get mixed up, but in fact, what happens is that there is this invariant subgroup namely the translations which you can take out then you get the Lorentz group. Okay. Likewise the group of Euclidean motions in a plane or in three dimensions you can take out the translations which are which form an invariant subgroup quotient it out and you will get the rotation group. So, this situation of invariant subgroups and factor groups is quite prevalent in quantum physics especially and also come plays a very important role in describing elementary particles. So, we will come to these things in the next talk.